It's in the night. It is not. So I, I think I updated the page to say PM. It's not a 7:15 a.m. exam. Um, exam times are actually carefully calculated. I'm not allowed to, for example, start it at seven o'clock. I have to start at 7:15. They're sort of legal exam slots. Um, and then you may know there are rules that the room where exams are held has to have at least twice as many seats as the number of people in the class. Um, so we can't have exams. Uh, you can't have for evening exams. In class exams, they don't. Nobody checks, but for evening exams, they have to be in a bigger room, so you're not very um, The exam will be open note, which you might like to hear. Um, do not, it is not open internet, open electronics, so do not expect to be watching videos or looking at slides, but you can bring a stack of paper from here to the ceiling with you if you want. I think that would be helpful. Um, the downside of that it means is that the answers are not going to be written down anywhere. Um, that the test will not be, can you flip through your notes? It will be, do you understand things? Can you take what, it is, what we did talk about or what is in the slides and extrapolate beyond that? Uh, so it's a mixed blessing. Yes? Yeah, you can print, you can print anything you want. Um, you can print all of Wikipedia and bring that if you want. Um, it's up to you. But no electronics. Um, <coughs> any other questions? OK, uh, so the other announcement, I think most people have seen it. Homework 2 is out. It is pretty much probably exactly what everybody would have expected if they were expecting something, which is look at the last four attacks that we talked about on web browsers and web servers. Um, and implement them, or free, like this is free. Um, doing uh, cookie theft, cross-site cross, cross -site request forgery, and SQL injection. So we're giving you a virtual machine with a web browser and a web server in there, and you have code for the web server, so you can sort of craft an attack um, to try to uh, exploit this environment. So to see how these attacks work in there. Um, and you can work with a partner. Again, it is due the Thursday before spring break. Um, there was a, I know that this is a busy time of year because I am like every other professor and want to have things not have homework due over spring break. Um, and so I know many of you may have projects and assignments in other places. Um, but the upside is that over spring break, you won't have anything to work on. And so you can truly relax uh, for this class at least. Okay, so. <coughs> We were talking about cryptography. Um, we had gone and talked about some of the primitives. Um, I just and we had gotten up as far as key transport. Um, so today we're going to talk a little bit about transport layer security as sort of a motivating example of how we use all of these cryptographic primitives. Um, a little bit about provable security, which is sort of a way of thinking about how to design secure systems. Um, One-time pads, uh, which is sort of a provably secure way of encrypting data, but also generally impractical. Um, and if we get to it, we'll talk about block ciphers, which is how, in practice, most of the data that we work with is actually encrypted. So just a quick recap. Symmetric encryption. Both sides share the same key. Um, and so you encrypt it and decrypt it with the same key. That is why it is symmetric. The encrypt and decrypt functions can actually sometimes be the same exact code, or they can be different code. Um, in asymmetric encryption, everybody has a public key and a secret key, with the property that if you encrypt with the public key, you can decrypt with the secret key. If you encrypt with the secret key, you can decrypt with the public key. So in this case, there are no secrets that Alice and Bob share. They both share public information, which is the public keys, and how they learn that is a separate problem we'll talk about later. Um, but it means that Alice can encrypt something with Bob's, with her public, uh, with her public key, or with Bob's public key, um, and then Bob can decrypt it with his secret key, and anybody listening in can't decrypt it because they don't know Bob's secret key. So we then talked about message authentication codes, and this is a way to attach something to a code to a message, some little addendum. Um, that proves that it is a legitimate unaltered message. So typically you would take a checksum and then encrypt that checksum somehow so that if the data is altered or the checksum is altered, they don't match anymore. 
with the property that anybody who is injecting data into the network and listening in, such as Mallory, um, can't generate a legitimate message with a legitimate tag or uh, authentication code on it. So this is how Bob, when Bob gets a message, knows that even if it's not encrypted, it was provided by Alice, so this provides integrity. Whereas encryption only provides secrecy, but not necessarily integrity. So we then talked about digital signatures, which is sort of the reverse, uh, or it's very similar. Um, so here, Alice wants to produce a public document and sort of a test that it came from her. So she can take a, like a checksum of some message, encrypt it with her secret key, and then anybody who looks at this signature, including Mallory, um, can sort of verify that it was generated by her. But we're doing this without, uh, and the message is public, the, the information to verify this is public. With the message authentication code, only someone who shared that secret key in that example could verify it. So here the property we want is that Mallory can't generate a message that has the same signature, uh, or she can't generate a signature for a message of her choosing because that would allow her to sort of fake somebody's signature to forge. Yes? Is there a difference between signature and certificate? A certificate is a higher level contract you build out of signatures. Oh. So it is an application of digital signatures. Uh, it sort of talks about what, do you, what is the contents of that thing that you're signing. So we'll get to this, but in particular, a certificate is when you put a digital signature on somebody's public key uh, and attach it to their name. And the idea is that you are assigning this thing and saying, I believe that this name and this public key go together. So for example, when you connect to Google, um, you would like to know, is this really Google? So Google provides you a certificate that has been digitally signed by somebody that says, this public key corresponds to the company Google and the URL www.google.com. And so by verifying that signature, you can have some reason to believe that that public key is indeed Google's public key. So we'll get to that shortly. Okay. So the final problem we didn't get to last time is key exchange. And so the question is, given the primitives you've seen so far, Alice and Bob, would like to communicate, um, exchange messages back and forth, and they would like to have an identical secret uh, symmetric key to do this encryption. And the reason that we care so much about a symmetric key, instead of using the public, the asymmetric key we talked about, is that symmetric key encryption is very fast. You can encrypt 10 gigabytes per second, more or less, relatively you know, not that difficult on a modern machine, whereas public key encryption you can do maybe a tenth of a gigabyte per second. So there's a very big speed difference. So if you're communicating lots of data back and forth, you don't want to do that using uh, asymmetric encryption. You want to use symmetric encryption. So the question is, and I want you to think about this and talk to the people sitting next to you, is given the primitives we just went over, um, how would you do this? So start off by assuming that you have, uh, we want to do this using asymmetric encryption. So Alice has a private key, a public key, and a secret key. Bob has a public key and a secret key. They both know each other's public key. And at the end of whatever messages you send back and forth, you want them both to know some secret symmetric key they can use for encrypting data. So think a little bit about this. I'll give you a few minutes uh, to kind of sketch out how you might solve this problem. Thank you. 
Are people about ready? Okay, does anybody want to suggest a set of messages we can send back and forth? Nobody? Not being ready. I guess Bob had a generator as an FT. Okay. And it's privileged by the Alice public key. Okay, I'm going to send it back to Alice. So, so Alice is the only one that can be put in by Alice Okay. So then they all can. Okay, so do you see how this works? Bob has Alice's public key. She can encrypt the key with um, Alice's public key, send it to Alice. Only Alice can decrypt this, so she knows the, the secret key K, and Bob knows the secret key K. That will indeed create a key that both Alice and Bob know. Any thoughts or comments on this protocol? Yes? If Alice is correct, you can see the key now as the semantic key for all implementation. Okay. So if this secret key is leaked, then everybody learns it. So that is true. So um, there is a property we'll talk, we may talk about later called perfect forward secrecy which is this property that says if you leak keys at one point, then everything after that point should still be secure. This protocol does not have that property because if we leak the secret key, you sort of learn everything. But it's still, I'm willing to live without that. The TLS protocol lived without that for 10 years, so it, it's a problem, but uh, you know, it's a compromise. Other thoughts on this protocol? Yes? What about if like, I message and then like, destroys it and then to a different key with Alice's public key that sends it out to Alice. Um, so Eve can't send messages. I think you're thinking of Mallory. Okay, so somebody, somebody, and then Alice has a key that she takes to Bob and actually. Okay, so you're suggesting that Mallory also knows PKA and PKB, and so Mallory can send a message. Mallory can create some key, key Mallory, and can encrypt PKA with, uh, encrypt key Mallory with PKA and send it to Alice. And Alice can't tell which of these two messages actually came from Bob. Right? So what this means is that if Alice actually believes this came from Bob, she will start encrypting data with this key, and Mallory can see everything. Uh, and so she can pretend to be Bob in this protocol as a result. So this is not a great protocol as a result um, because anybody who wants to, using public information, can trick Alice into using their key instead of Bob's key. So any thoughts on how we might modify this protocol? Just let me just write Mallory down here. Okay. Yes, Jane. So Bob cannot put encrypt this message both with Alice's public key and also with his secret key. Like this? Okay. So here um, we have a property that, let's see, what can Mallory do in this case? So this is all 
information that Bob has, so Bob can generate this message legitimately. Mallory or Eve has PKB, so they can decrypt this and see PKA encrypting the key. But they can't decrypt this, so even though they can de even though they could decrypt this, they can't sort of say much. Um, and Alice has public key B, so she can decrypt this. She has secret key A, so she, she can decrypt this and see the key. Yes. Um, so what you're what you're saying is this is a one message protocol. So at the end of this message, um, Alice has the key, but Bob doesn't know that Alice has the key. Um, and so what you're suggesting is that we send something back. something like this back, so that um, this confirms to Bob that Alice has the key. Okay, so that's something you can add on, and the protocols we see will indeed incorporate something like this. Uh, but to just get a key on both sides that you think they know, this alone will sort of communicate that key. What this doesn't do, um, so when are, when are the cases when this would be useful? Why might we care to sort of have this confirmation? Yes. Um, uh, to fight against a man in the middle attack, possibly for uh -huh. future data transfer. Um, so, a man in the middle attack, you're worried that um, Bob might that somehow Alice and Bob, like the man in the middle attack is when you have the communication sort of goes to Mallory in the middle and Mallory can sort of decrypt the messages from Alice and then re-encrypt them to Bob or something like that. Yeah, so it's good to confirm who you're talking to before you start transferring stuff. Right, so um, what we are worried is that, so the question is we, you're suggesting Bob should confirm that Alice has this key. So the question is, is there a way that um, Mallory, so in general, I think you're right. The question is, in this protocol, is there a way that Mallory can actually do a, a woman in the middle attack here? Um, and we don't really need to go into that at this point. Um, there's a, there's a, I think this is an example of a more general problem, which is that Mallory could potentially record this message and send it later, right? So Mallory can't decrypt this message, but she can record it, send it later, and get Alice to use the wrong key. So if Mallory can ever sort of decode, uh, figure out the secret key K, she can make Alice use this old key that was used long ago. Because there's nothing in here that says this is sort of a new key that Bob just sent me. We don't know when this message came. So by sending this message back, Bob can see that Alice sort of is using the key that he sent most recently and sort of has the right key. So. This is called freshness, and it sort of says we want to make sure that we are both using the same information that we just communicated as compared to stale information that was recorded off the internet, off the network, and replayed later. Um, so the real protocols tend to be a lot more complicated than this, but this is an example of sort of how you use these cryptographic primitives to sort of build higher level operations, because we use asymmetric encryptions to build a way to get agreement on a symmetric key that we could then use for efficient encryption. Um, so this is sort of the picture of what we want to end up with. So public key transport is what you just did. Um, it's not actually shown here. There's another version called Diffie-Hellman encryption, which has this property of perfect forward secrecy. Because um, even if you if you get the secret keys and can decrypt everything, you still can't see what the encryption, what the newly encrypted data is. Okay, so I now want to sort of explain how these primitives are used in an example where suppose you want to connect to Amazon and actually buy something. How do we sort of put all these different primitives together? So you know when you want to connect the internet to Amazon, 
you know, abstractly, you're going to connect, you're going to say, I want to order one of something, here's my credit card number. Um, and if we think about what an attacker might do, so an attacker can steal your credit card number. Um, so we care about data confidentiality. This means we really want to encrypt all the data so that nobody can see that credit card number. The second thing we're worried about is that the attacker can change the quant, can change the message somehow and change what you're ordering, maybe change the delivery address. So we care about integrity. So we want to make sure that when we send messages, if there's any modifications, those modifications will be detected and will not be accepted. So when we think about just encryption alone, encryption alone doesn't provide integrity. It just provides confidentiality or secrecy. The message authentication codes and digital signatures do provide integrity because while they don't encrypt the data, they have this uh, checksum that can sort of verify the data wasn't modified. So overall, we call this a secure channel when you have a channel where you can send data and nobody can see what you're sending or can modify what you're sending. So let's look now at how the transport layer security protocol started work. So this protocol was invented by Netscape back ages ago. Um, it was called Secure Sockets Layer for a while. It then became an internet standard called Transport Layer Security. It's been through a whole lot of different versions because people keep finding that the version that they're using is broken or insecure, and then they make a new version that is more secure. So the overall goal of this protocol has sort of two phases. The first phase is this key exchange protocol that we just talked about, where we want to get the client and server to agree on some encryption, some symmetric encryption key that they can use for sending data back and forth. Um, and then once they have that, there's a separate protocol that says, how do you actually encrypt the data and send it across? Um, so this is sort of once you have this channel where you're encrypting things and integrity checking it, we now want to actually, we have to, somehow we have to take the data you're sending and we have to communicate it and put in this message authentication code so the server or client understands what the format is and can see it. Um, so for key exchange, uh, this protocol uses hash functions or checksum functions to create uh, sort of a fingerprint of the message. It create, uses digital signatures, public key encryption, for the secure channel, it uses symmetric encryption and message authentication codes. Um, and the reason we do this is that we worry about replay attacks, which I mentioned is where Mallory may record a message and play it back later. We worry about man in the middle attacks, where uh, Mallory may convince Alice to connect to her, and then Mallory can connect to Bob. And if she can decrypt things, she can sort of see everything Alice is doing and modify it and then send it off to Bob. Um, we also worry about truncation attacks where Mallory may intercept the messages and sort of leave off the part at the end or you know, remove part of the message so that the whole, we are guaranteed the whole message get through and a number of other attacks. The goals of TLS fairly clear. You basically want secure, you want everything to be nice and secure. Um, okay. So as you can see, TLS or SSL was designed back in 2009. It was broken after this by some researchers at Berkeley, so that created version three. Um, that was broken around 1998, so that created TLS version one. Um, and this one was sort of a public effort that had lots of cryptographers involved. So there's a general principle that security is really hard. The more people you get involved, the more secure it is. It's no guarantee, but it's better than not doing it. Um, this was then broken uh, a number of different times, a number of different ways. So then TLS 1.1 was released that sort of fixed these problems. Um, and then TLS 1.2 was released, and then TLS 1.3 is being released. And so the key message is that, you know, there's sort of an iterative sequence where people, really smart people, do their best to design something, and they get it wrong, and then you fix it, and then people break it again, and they get it wrong, and you fix it. Um, and this is the general trend with all security, that people do the best that they can, they can't think of attacks that have never been done before, and they, they fail in some way and you fix it. So a key lesson here is that when you're in designing a protocol like this, you need to think about how do you make a protocol that can be fixed in the future? So if we wanted to change this protocol in the future to sort of add in, you know, suppose we wanted to add in a random number, some number A here. How do we tell Alice to sort of expect there's a number A here? 
we probably want some kind of version number. In this protocol that sort of says what protocol version are we using, and then if we extend it, we can sort of say, oh, we're on version 1.2, and now we're going to add some more fields in here. So for security purposes, and this is true in general, but having protocols that you can extend and you can fix over time become incredibly important. So there is a challenge here uh, with protocols that can be fixed. And the challenge is, what do you do if you're a web server and you have been fixed and you're talking to somebody's Windows XP machine from 2001 running Internet Explorer 4 that doesn't have the new protocol? What should you do? Right? Either you can um, let them connect and send data in, in ways that are known to be insecure, or you can reject that client and lose money. Um, similarly, as somebody uses a web browser, if you connect to a web server that is doing something you want to get to and they don't use the latest version of TLS and they're insecure, you have to choose. Do you want to connect to that machine or not connect to that machine, knowing that it's insecure? And so typically what happens is when these things are broken is that people will say, okay, we will give you three years to update all your clients and servers to use the latest version and then we'll shut things off. So I believe there's an agreed upon date to this for Google's going to disable support for TLS version 1.1, I think in 2020 perhaps, or maybe it's 1.2. But so people schedule and say, we're just going to live with the insecurity for a long time because we can't break the internet, even if it's not secure. Um, but then you as a, as a client can sort of figure this out. So this begs a whole other question, which is, um, you know, how do you, uh, how do you sort of as a client and server negotiate what uh, protocol to use? So Alice might say, I want to use 1.0, uh, or I can do 1.0 and 1.1, and then Bob would say, oh, let's do version 1.1. So this is called a negotiation. The client says, these are the versions I work with. The server will say, this is the best version I have. Let's work with that. So this is great. The challenge is, what if Mallory comes in here and removes this? Right? Mallory modifies this first message to remove the 1.1. And so Bob thinks that Alice only supports 1.0. And then this will trick Bob into also using 1.0, which Mallory knows she can break. This is called a downgrade attack because you are downgrading a protocol from a secure version to a version that is supported for compatibility, but that's known to be insecure. Why, why would network support uh, supporting like lower, lower versions of things? Why wouldn't it force you to update? So the reason is, as I said, that you have that, that if you look at the world of the, the set of people on the internet and you look at what they're running, there's a lot of people, not iOS users or Mac users, there's a lot of people who are running older protocols. So you think about a lot of companies may have standardized on Windows XP back in 2004, and they still have machines using Windows XP. Um, or they might be using Windows Vista or Windows 7 and you know, standardized on some version of Internet Explorer. Uh, and they sort of say, if nothing actually breaks and my software hasn't changed, why should I pay to upgrade and fix everything? So there's just a lot of people running very old software out there. And so you support the older version because you still want to provide service to them. Um, and they're a substantial fraction of your users. You don't want to get them mad. Um, so something to think about is how do we, is there a way we can prevent this attack? Yes. So the thing is, when we, so you're saying, can we use some key to encrypt the version numbers here? Something like that. So the challenge is, when Alice sends this first message, Alice and Bob don't have a secure channel yet for encrypting anything. And Alice may not even have Bob's public key, and so she can't just encrypt this with Bob's public key. So it turns out that encrypting things in this very first message is a challenging problem. But that's, you know, that's definitely an approach because if this is encrypted, then it can't be modified. If we encrypt it and put a message authentication code, then it can't be modified, or we can detect modifications. Yes? So a digital signature has the same effect, but again, we need, we, we, we could do a digital signature, but sort of, it means that we have to sort of, that, um, 
It means two things. It means that Bob has to have a public key for Alice to start off with. And when you connect to a random website, they don't have your public key. And in fact, you don't have their public key when you first connect, which is sort of part of what the TLS protocol will do. So, yes? Is so it could be a truncation attack. It could also be that Mallory is intercepting the messages that she's running in a network switch and is just modifying the messages as they go by. So suppose she breaks into your Wi-Fi router and is modifying the Linux on your Wi-Fi router to, uh, when she sees these messages, sort of not forward the right message. So the ultimate way you solve this is that uh, these are sort of the first messages. You're then going to do some kind of key exchange. And then the last step you do before you actually have your secure channel is at the very end, once you've done your key exchange and have keys, then you can send a message authentication code of what you put in the first message. So the idea is we can't verify it's correct right at the very beginning, but after we set up a secure channel, we can verify it. And so we will, in effect, replay this message at the end and Bob can sort of say, is this message the same as this message, indicating that nothing was modified, or is this message different, indicating that Mallory changed it in some way. And so this is how you can sort of securely negotiate, because you don't, all you have to do is make sure that you're, you've negotiated correctly before you start sending data back and forth. You don't have to do it immediately in the protocol. You can just check it before it actually matters. Okay. So let's sort of see how TLS works, and then we'll be sort of moving after this. We'll sort of look at different ways of implementing these primitives. Okay, so the first thing at the, that the client does in this case, this is a bank customer, is they're going to pick a random number, and uh, random numbers in encryption protocols, security protocols are called nonces. And the idea is you want it some, the idea that this is something unpredictable. Nobody should be able to guess in advance what this random number will be. You're going to send a client hello message. So every message in a protocol in the TLS protocol has a name that sort of, so that the server knows what should be in, or the client knows what should be in this message. Inside this client hello message is max ver. This says what is the maximum version that this client will, will accept? You know, 1.0, 1.1, 1.2, 1.3. Well, and then it will send a list of the ciphers that it supports. Is it support RSA? elliptic curve. There's multiple different ways you can encrypt data, different asymmetric and symmetric encryption mechanisms. Um, and so the client will say which of these it supports. And then it also has a list of compression methods. TLS has built into it compression, so you send less data. So the idea is we want to negotiate both the version, the version number, the way we're going to encrypt data called the cipher suite, and the way we're going to compress data, whether it's LZH or something else. So this means that we, the nice thing is by doing this, we can sort of extend the protocol to add new ways of encrypting data, new ways of compressing data, um, even if the protocol itself kind of stays the same, so we can have variance. So the server will pick a random number, nonce, the server nonce. It will send back a message server hello that has a version that it picks. So this is the maximum, supposedly, of its version and the versions the client supports. It'll send back its random number. It'll send back a session ID because it wants to know, it wants to remember this client for the future. And so the session ID tells the client, include this session ID the next time you communicate so I know who you are, I know what channel this is. Um, and then it will say, this is the cipher suite and the compression method I want to use. So these first two messages have, these two messages have no encryption in them whatsoever. Um, the server will then send its certificate. So the certificate is how the client will get the public key. So certificate um, includes the public key of the bank, the name of the bank, and then it has a digital signature on of both of these things that was created by some authority that the client already trusts. So when you install a browser, it turns out your browser comes with a list of 20 or 30 different authorities and their public keys, and it says if you see anything digitally signed with the secret key corresponding to this public key, you should believe it. So like VeriSign is one of these. Um, and so this, uh, this, met, this certificate will be signed by one of these 20 companies that the browser pre-included as being trusted. 
So once the client sees this, the client can verify, can look at this, verify the signature by decrypting it with the public key it has embedded in the browser and say, is this a valid certificate? Which means it should believe the public key inside of it is attached to the website that is listed inside of the certificate. So that is how you know when you go to google.com, Google sends you its public key with the name google.com attached, signed by VeriSign, digitally signed by VeriSign, and then you can sort of prove, you can check for yourself that that works. So at this point, you know the public, after this, the client knows the public key for the server. But until this point, the client didn't know this. So, uh, so the client will now pick what's called a pre-master secret, and it does this by encrypting, um, it picks a, a pre-master secret and encrypt using the public key. So this E is encrypt, and then we follow that with a key in this example, PK, um, of the server, and we send this pre-master secret. So we do this because we want to, uh, we want, this is how we sort of are going to get our session key, our secret key we're going to use to encrypt data with later. So we're going to send this, so this encrypted message back to the bank. The bank can then decrypt this with its secret key and get the same pre-master secret. Um, and then the both sides can compute the natural master secret from this pmaster secret by using a pseudo random function, which is basically a hash function. Um, and it can do this by, by computing a hash over the pre-master secret, the string master secret, uh, the, the nonce from the client and the nonce from the server. So the key is that this is all information both the client and the server have. So they can both compute the same master secret. So one question is why, any thoughts on why we include the string master secret in the middle? How might this help us? It's kind of bizarre. When I first ran across this, I actually was working at Microsoft. I had to implement something that had this. And I, had, I really had no idea for about 10 years after that why I had to do that. Yes? Is it a check for integrity, possibly? Like, are you checking that the message is the same and that it's in the same place as uh, when from, from the source to where you're sending it? Um, close. Uh, it doesn't, I mean, it is sort of an extra check on things. Any other thoughts on why you might do this? Okay. Uh, so the reason you do this is it means that there's a couple of reasons you might do this. One, it means that you can use the pre-master secret for different things to generate different secrets from it um, that have different purposes, and it can't accidentally be the same thing. So this says that we, the only by doing this, we know that to generate this, you have to include the master secret. Any accidental use of the master of the pre-master secret, like suppose we encrypt something else with it. Um, we know that whatever else we encrypt won't include the string master secret, so we can never accidentally generate the master secret and release it. So we basically put this in there to prevent ourselves from accidentally ever calculating a pseudo random function with the same key uh, and making a secret. Suppose, for example, an attacker could give us a string that we would then compute the pseudo random function over. If they gave us the string that had NC and NS in it somehow, um, they might be able to make us generate the secret and reveal it. So this sort of makes it a little bit stronger, makes it less likely that we will accidentally release this secret. So it's really sort of cryptographic hygiene of making it slightly harder to accidentally leak things. So this is the initial protocol that does the key exchange because at the end of this, both sides have this master secret. The next thing that happens is that we want to set up the secure channel. And this is done using the change cipher spec uh, message. And this says we are now switching from unencrypted mode to encrypted mode. And so in this, we're going to send the message finished. We're going to send the master secret. Uh, we're going to send the um, a hash of the master secret client finished, and then a hash of the entire transcript. And so the idea is here we're using this hash of the master secret. Oh, uh, with a different string, which means that, again, it can't be confused with this one somehow. And we're going to put the hash of the transcript. This is how we check to make sure nobody did a downgrade attack. 
because we are going to sort of show what the messages the client actually sent, and the server can verify that they actually received those same exact messages. And then the server will send a message back, as was suggested earlier, um, to sort of say, I'm finished, and the server's finished, and here's my transcript. And so the client can now verify the server saw all the right messages, and they both have agreed that they are now going to encrypt everything from this point on. So as you can see, this is quite a bit of work. Instead of when you connect to a normal web server, you send one round trip to send a SYN pack and set up a TCP connection. Here we're adding a lot more round trips, um, which is one reason websites don't like to do this, because it slows everything down. Okay, so the final piece is what about, yes? How can that limitation for every new session that we have on the website? So even if we have a certified store, So there, that's an excellent question. So the question is, do we do this entire protocol for every um, new session to a website? And the answer is no. Um, and the reason is there is a separate version of the protocol. Um, you remember there's that session ID. <coughs> so the server will retain sessions uh, even though you're done for now. So if the client still remembers their session ID, they can basically bootstrap the protocol and send a message saying, let's restart this old session and then encrypt things with one round trip. Um, and so <coughs> using that, you don't need to replay the whole protocol when you're reconnecting. And so you're absolutely right that there are shortcuts here. But the first time you connect to a server, you have to go through all of this. Okay, so here's the record layer. This is the actual secure channel having encrypt data. Um, so we have some message we want to send. So we're going to create keys that we can use here for the client and server to use. And they are going to be, again, a pseudo-random function of the master secret, some string with those two random numbers. So one question is, why do we have NS and NC mixed in here? Right, so one thing is that this is, we, this is how we have freshness, because the client sent their nonce, the server had to send it back, so they could see that it was a response to their recent message. It also, the other thing that it does is it means that both the client and the server are adding some randomness into the key here. And so this means that you don't have a faulty server that is trying to leak information by generating bad keys, or a faulty client that is sort of reusing keys that somebody might know by mixing in servers randomness. It also means if you have a bad random number generator on one of the two sides, you're not as, as much at risk because you now need to sort of know what two different machines are doing um, to sort of predict what two different machines do to launch certain kinds of attacks. So again, it's sort of hygiene um, that makes this stronger. So basically what we're gonna do is we're going to encrypt the mess, we're gonna create two keys out of this, and when the client sends messages, they'll encrypt it with key one, and when the server sends messages back, they can encrypt it with key two. So when we look at the primitives that we have, we're sort of using all the primitives. So the certificate used a digital signature. The um, when we were sort of when we were gen when we were sending information back, that first encrypted message used public key encryption. We use pseudo random functions and hash functions to generate our keys when we're doing the when we're actually starting to encrypt things. And when then we're using symmetric encryption to actually do all the encryption back and forth. So this protocol is sort of a fairly involved protocol that uses lots and lots of different primitives. Um, so there's a lot more details on you know, how we do the public key encryption, how we do the secret encryption, symmetric key encryption, that we'll get to later. But any questions on TLS before I go on? Yes? Correct. If you use HTTP, then you don't do any of this. And if you use HTTPS, then your browser knows I'm going to connect to port, I think, 443 instead of port 80, and that um, instead of sending the HTTP message to begin with, I'm going to send the um, client hello message as the first message. And then it will only send the HTTP message uh, encrypted as the first message after it does the change cypherspace. Yes? The pre-master secret. So the, the pre-master secret is sort of the root of all other secrets. So the idea is you want several different keys here for different purposes. 
And so we are going to need this master secret that we can use to generate these, uh, these keys for sending messages back and forth. Um, and so we take the pre-message secret, which has some randomness from both sides, and we are going to sort of encrypt that in some way to create a master secret that we can then use to generate additional keys. And so it basically gives us the ability to, to have a shared secret both sides know that we don't have to send it over the network ever, and that we don't encrypt things with ever, and we can generate sort of temporary secret keys that we actually encrypt data with. So the master secret, you may notice, never is never used to encrypt anything that goes on the network. So an attacker who can see messages can never see anything encrypted with the master secret, which makes it very hard to sort of uh, attack that message and find what the master secret is. Instead, we see messages derived from the master secret. So if you break those, you don't actually get to the master secret, which is still secure. So it's sort of another layer of security. You have to break multiple things to get through to that. Okay, so the thing to note is this is sort of a design, you know, design break, redesign break way of building things, which is really common in security. Um, you know, we know that there are known attacks on TLS 1.2, which is what we're using. Um, and the thing to note also is that even fairly simple uses of encryption, like setting up a secure channel is something people have been trying to do for 40 years. You would think people would know how to do it after 40 years of work and they're still getting it wrong. And they get it wrong because, you know, the world of, of attacks you can launch is somewhat infinite and so it's hard to say exactly what you have to defend against. Uh, and pretty much every other security protocol in addition to TLS has had the same problem. SSH, IPsec, Kerberos, uh, the protocols used for Wi-Fi, the protocols used by cellular networks, all of these have had problems where people have broken it in some ways and the protocol had to be redesigned to fix this. Um, so what can we do better than this? So there's a notion of provable security. And the idea is we would like to create a mechanism where we can use sort of mathematical and logical proofs to prove that our mechanism has some security property. Um, this idea was sort of invented by Claude Shannon in 1949, following World War II. He's sort of the father of information theory. Um, and, um, and the idea is this will hopefully give us a stronger mechanism because we actually have to prove where the security coming, is coming from in the protocol. So what this means is we need some formal definitions of the scheme semantics and what security means. So for example, what does it mean to encrypt something correctly? How do we know when something is encrypting well or encrypting poorly, right? Because there's some mechanisms that do a bad job, some that do a good job. So we need a formal notion of what encryption actually means. Um, so once we have these formal notions, we can then have a proof that sort of shows for some assumptions of you know, what's hard and what's easy that things can't be broken. So here, let's sort of look at symmetric encryption. This is sort of a schematic view of what symmetric encryption does. So there's the first step is we need to generate a key. So we're going to have some random source of random numbers, RK, that we put into our key generator, some box that takes random numbers and generates keys. And one thing to note is that even this step is very difficult and done wrong. I mentioned the problem where early browsers were just using the current time of day as their source of randomness. The same problem happens on embedded devices like IoT devices, right? These are very simple devices. They don't do very much. It's very hard for them to make a random number because there's nothing random about the world they live in. And so how you actually get good random numbers in that environment is sort of an unsolved problem still. So with this key generation, we are then going to generate our symmetric key K. We then need to get it to both the client and the server, the two sides here. That's handled by the key exchange protocol, as in TLS. So we're not going to we're going to assume that has sort of happened, and sort of after that stage, both sides have the um, encrypted data. Um, so <clears throat> what we then want to do is take some message. We might add some extra randomness to this message if we want to. We're going to encrypt it and produce a ciphertext, um, and then we are going to send it to the server, who will decrypt this, and it will either give us a message out or we would like it to give an error. Now, in some cases it might not give us an error even when it's wrong because the, the decryption mechanism might not be able to detect when something is wrong, so it might always just return some message. 
So what does it mean um, to be correct? It means that when you know um, when you decrypt something that you encrypted, you will get the same uh, the same message that you encrypted with probability one for all the you know using the randomness that was provided. So independent of what random things you provide, when you decrypt something, you will get the same thing back. So this is sort of uh, encryption to decryption works. It doesn't tell us whether anybody else can decrypt it. It just says, at the very least, we need to go to decrypt it. So Kirchhoff's principle, remember, um, guides us here. So in this, what parts of this are secret and what parts of this are not secret? Any thoughts? So, yeah, it's the ciphertext. Okay, so the ciphertext is secret. Uh, well, so, sorry, the ciphertext is actually not secret. I take it back. Because the ciphertext is sent over some open network, uh, broadcast through the air of the radio. What's your thought? Okay, um, except for the key and the message, right? So this says that the key generation should be public. The, so everything in the boxes should be publicly known. This is the mechanism. This is how we generate keys, how we do encryption, how we do decryption. And you're suggesting that everything but M here and K should be public. So what happens if this RK and R are public? Um, so this is so that RK is sort of the source of randomness that we're using to generate keys. And to some extent, if that's public, somebody else might be able to you know, that's the only input to KG. So if somebody else sees, knows exactly what RK is, they can generate the same key. And so we really don't want, you know, where we get that randomness from is find that mechanism in public. The actual randomness, we don't want to be public because somebody can then predict how we generate keys. The same thing down below, we're adding randomness in to make this harder. We don't want people to know what that randomness is. But you're right that everything in the boxes should be public here. Okay, so and sort of to decide what it means to be secure, we have to think about what are the attacks that we're worried about. And some of these attacks are obvious when you've thought about, some are sort of not necessarily what you would think about. So the goal of the attacker is twofold. One goal is to be able to decipher a particular message or set of messages. The second goal is to obtain the key which allows the attacker to, uh, to decrypt everything. And you might be able, in some cases, to get some messages decrypted without being able to decrypt all of them. Um, and that's why these are two different goals. So the hardest attack is sort of an unknown plain text where you have the cipher text and nothing else. You don't know what's being encrypted um, by, you can sort of see encrypted messages go by and you want to break it. So think about you know, the classic case of uh, military intelligence. You see some messages go by uh, from the enemy. You can hear the messages, but you have no idea what's being said. You don't know what the key is. You hopefully know the mechanism eventually, and you're trying to decrypt it. Another attacker that is sort of stronger is a known plain text. So this is the case where you know what's being sent, um, and so you know the contents of the message, and what you're trying to do is figure out what the key is. So can you think about when this might apply? Like, when, it seems a bit of a strange attack. How could this attack ever work? Or how, how would, how, when would this scenario take place? Yes. Just to start with some messages, always have some standard protocol that goes to the other start. Right. So think about when you connect to a web server, the first thing you send is this HTTP GET request. And pretty much every browser, every Chrome browser on Mac OS will send the same message. And so you can see by looking at the message that your browser sends to a web server, you can see what is the plain text of a message that some other browser sent to a web server. So you actually know in that first message, with pretty high probability exactly what those characters are. And so that's a case where you have known plain text. <coughs> um, and so you know what the message is con containing and you're just trying to figure out what the key is. So the next level up is chosen plain text. So chosen plain text says, 
I get to pick some message of my choosing, any message I want, and I can get it encrypted with the key, and then I can see the ciphertext afterwards, and I can try to get, use this to decrypt what that key is. So when might this occur? Yeah. So when you send something server, it will be back. Uh -huh. Okay, so uh, when a server sends something back to a client, now remember the server generally knows the key here um, already if the server is directly communicating with the client. But that's sort of definitely on the right track. So you have to think of a scenario where can you, as a client, get somebody else to encrypt it. So think about the case, again, maybe a blog website where you can generate a comment you could put whatever you want into that comment, and when the server go, when a client goes and reads that over TLS, the server will encrypt it, but they're encrypting the data that you provided. Or for example, if you have put an image somewhere and you put a link to it, when somebody goes to the web page and goes to fetch that image over an encrypted channel, they are fetching your data that you created over an encrypted channel, and then you can sniff that channel to see how it was encrypted. So you basically have to sort of trick the client into downloading something or uploading something of your choice, but encrypting it with their mechanism where you can't see the key. So that's a chosen plain text. Um, and then a chosen ciphertext um, is like an unknown plain text, but you get to actually, you know, you get to take ciphertext, you make your own message, give it to somebody, and they encrypt it and give the response to you. So this actually happens with things like um, credit card machines where you, uh, you can sort of feed in encrypted data and it will digitally sign it or decrypt it and verify it. Um, and so that's a scenario where you control this device and you can feed information in and sort of see what the device, feed in different ciphertexts and feed it in and see what happens. Similarly, with any web server, you know, you can sort of send it a bunch of ciphertext and see what happens when you send it some piece of ciphertext to see if it accepts it as a good message that might echo pieces back or is it a bad message. So again, these are the kinds of attacks we worry about we want to build protection against. Okay, so we're now going to actually talk about some encryption mechanisms. We're going to start with bad ones um, that are easy to do in your head. There are actually are very strong encryption mechanisms you can do on hand. There's a really cute one using a deck of cards where the, the order of the cards in the deck is the key, and then you sort of there's rules on how you sort of flip cards over to encrypt things. Okay, so a substitution cipher, this is also named a Caesar cipher because it was used by the Romans back in Caesar's time. And it's a very simple mechanism. And the idea is that we are going to substitute every character input with a different character in the output. And we're not gonna use the characters for, we're not gonna use one output character for two different input symbols. So in this case, the key is this table that maps the input to the output. So here we're just looking at, looking at the numbers 0 through 9, and the key is then the permutation of the digits 0 through 9 into some other format. So if we want to encrypt a credit card number, for example, we're going to transform each of these characters using this key into some output. Um, and so this means that we can have a table of credit card numbers and we can sort encrypt it. And even if you download this information without knowing what the key is, you can't figure out what the credit card numbers are. Um, with the key, you know, it's a very simple transformation. <clears throat> so, one obvious weakness of this is that if you know one plain text, you leak everything. So if you can get your credit card number in here and you can see how it's encrypted, you can see how a number that you knew was transformed that tells you how each of the digits is transformed. So this is totally defenseless against uh, a known plain text attack because you can see the cipher. Any questions so far? So now what about other kinds of attacks? Suppose it's not known of known play text attack. How secure is this? What other things might go wrong? Um, right, so here's sort of how you actually would go through this um, and spit things out. So suppose we're doing this with characters, though, um, and a chosen, and a, a, suppose we're looking at characters. Let's think about how big this key is. So we have 26 characters. So 
a random permutation. That's 26 factorial different possible permutations. That's you know four times 10 to the 26 keys. So it's actually quite a few keys that would be hard to randomly attack. So is there some other way that we can try to attack this mechanism? Yes. Well, how right, you're exactly right. So this is where uh, transmitting random numbers using this mechanism isn't too bad because you can't actually predict what digits will be. Credit cards aren't random, so they're not a good example of that. Whereas text is definitively not random, right? If I give you a bunch of random characters, you're going to tell me this is gibberish, and the chance of like any particular message um, being a correct, uh, the chance of any sequence of, of letters being a correct message is pretty low. So if we look at a profile of popularity of characters in English, we can see that there is a wide distribution, probably widely known to people who play Scrabble, that E is very popular, you know, S is popular, J is very unpopular, Q is unpopular, X and Z are unpopular. So if we take a message and we encrypt it, what happens to this shape, right? The shape remains, but the shape is now attacked. That, that shape is still going to be there uh, the popularity of characters won't change at all because we're doing a one-to-one -one mapping of input characters, output characters. What that, which character it is might change, but the popularity distribution doesn't change. So this means that, yes? I want to be a very short message. So for very short messages, uh, it can be reasonable because it, there could be some ambiguity. So, you know, if you're sending one message that is eight characters, then there's a reasonable chance you could pull this off. But uh, you know, typically we want to do more than that. So we do this with sort of frequency analysis. We look at the ciphertext. Um, so at the bottom are sort of the cryptic characters. We then look at the popularities and we say, oh, the most popular one is probably E and then T and then A. Um, and so in effect, what you're going to do is basically sort things. So we sort English characters by popularity. We sort the ciphertext by popularity. And then we sort of know that the rank on the left is the same on the rank on the right, and so we can assign the letters and decrease. So this means you don't need brute force to do an attempt to decrypt something like this. You can do it with a pretty simple frequency analysis that is very fast, and that you know a lot of people doing puzzles do for fun. So needless to say, the state of encryption changed between the year zero and the year 1941. So this is a picture of the German Enigma machine that the Germans used during World War II. Um, and the way that it worked is that you would type messages on this keyboard and lights would light up telling you an encrypted version, you know, for every character you pressed, it would tell you some output character that you would send over the network. And then internally it had multiple rotors. This one has four rotors. And then behind the bot, behind this, there's a bunch of wires you can plug and unplug. So you first fill in these wires to sort of have some particular set of connections. For every given day, there might be a different uh, combination of rotor, starting rotor positions. So each rotor has 26 positions. You start off the four rotors in some position each day. Um, and then when you type things, uh, the rotors would move. And so every time you type a character, the, the, the substitution cipher for the next character changes. So the substitution changes every single time that you're changing something. So we can't play this same uh, trick of, do, of looking at popularity. So this was broken by the Allies um, using some of the techniques we talked about of sort of looking for known plain text attacks, looking at messages that were sent twice, so we can sort of use that to derive information. Um, but as part of this, there's sort of a raised interest in sort of the theoretical properties of cryptography. What does it mean to actually be a very strong encryption system? So Claude Shannon was sort of the person who took this on, and he came up with a perfectly secure encryption mechanism that is still perfectly secure, you know, 50, 70, almost 70 years later. So it's called a one-time pad. So one of the things you will see, by the way, is that encryption uses lots of XORs. And the reason you use a lot of XORs is XORs don't lose any information. You can apply an XOR twice and get the same data out, which is the property you want for encryption. If you add things, they tend to, you know, you lose some information when you overflow. Okay. So a one-time pad says, we're, to, the way we encrypt things is we're going to start with some message of length L. Our key is going to be a string of random bits that is the same length as L. So our random key is exactly the same size as our message. 
We can only use that random key once. The way we encrypt something is we're going to take every bit of the message and XOR it with the key. And this will produce an encrypted message. To decrypt it, we're going to take every bit of the ciphertext and XOR it with the key again. And because of the way XOR works, this will give us out our message. Is this operation fairly clear? So there's a question, and I've said this is perfectly secure. Why is this secure? And what does it mean to be secure? This sort of, it's nice because this is such a simple mechanism, we can all understand it, and we can figure out from this what it means to be perfectly secure if we know this is perfectly secure. So what Shannon came up with is that something is perfectly secure if for all message pairs, M and M prime, that the probability that you encrypted the key with some message M at uh, equals a ciphertext is the same as the probability that you encrypted some other input message M prime and got the same ciphertext. So what this is saying is that from the ciphertext, the probability uh, that the message was M or some different message M prime is the same, which means you can't tell which of these two input messages it was based on the ciphertext. Right, because what you want to know is the attacker, is this a message that says attack at dawn or attack at dusk? And this is telling us that we that the probability that the message is attack at dawn is identical to the probability of the message being attack at dusk. Uh, when we know the ciphertext. That is sort of the definition of perfect security. So one thing to note is does it tell us anything about whether the message might be attack at dawn or a weather report? Uh, does it help us with sort of that, whether it's one of those two questions? So one thing to note is that the attacker might know a distribution of messages you're sending. They might know that most of the messages are weather messages and only 1% of the messages are attack messages. And so that's information they have going in and the idea is at the end of it, uh, whatever probabilities they know for the input message should be the same as what they knew in advance. If it's 99% chance it's a weather message before you decrypt, before you saw this, there's still a 99% chance it's a weather message. But it doesn't mean that they don't know that there's some, that most of the messages are weather messages, because that's information they already had going in. So, seeing a cipher text leaks nothing about what was encrypted. So does a substitution cipher meet this? And the answer is no, because it leaks the distribution of input characters. So Shannon showed that one-time pads are perfectly secure. And the reason is, if we have some input message, um, some ciphertext C and some uh, message M, you know, the probability of this ciphertext actually coming from message M is one half bit zero and one raised to the length of the message because the key could be anything. And so for every single bit in the input message, there's a 50% probability it's zero, a 50% probability it's one. We have nothing, no other information to go on. If we then look at some other message, M prime, it's the same exact probability, which is, you know, without knowing the key, anything about the key, it's uh, identical probabilities. And because the probabilities are the same, then it's perfectly secure. We leak nothing about the input. Right, so the key here is that we compute the probabilities of some message with a cipher. We compute the probability of being some other message. If the probabilities are the same, that meets our definition of perfect security. We can then conclude that the encryption mechanism is perfectly secure. So it seems great, right? We have a perfect encryption mechanism. We're all done. We should go home. However, it's not that easy. Right? So let's think about what an attacker could actually do in this case. So one problem is that the key has to be as large as your message. If you're sending, you know, you're streaming a video off Netflix, this means you have to have a gigabyte or more of key material, and you can only use it once. So if you reuse a key for two messages, right, then you can actually XOR those messages again. When you XOR something that has K in it, those two, the Ks cancel out. And what you're left is with the XOR of M and M prime, which might leak information. If there's overlapping information in there, you'll see that there's zeros. The parts that are different will actually have values in it. So you're leaking information. The length of the message is obvious. So if you're sending messages that have different lengths, you know, attack at dawn and attack in the afternoon have different lengths. So you can see whether it's the attack at dawn or the attack in the afternoon message. 
Um, the other thing is that Mallory can flip bits here, right? Mallory can take some of the bits you're sending and flip them, and there's nothing in this encryption mechanism that will stop them from being flipped or would detect those bits are flipped. So the, you can flip some messages, for example, if you know the offset where the amount of money is in a message to your bank, you can flip bits in that offset and change the amount of money being sent, and the bank can't tell that the message is modified using this mechanism. So one-time pads are actually used, so the federal government uh, will print out books with random numbers in them, and spies can then use these random numbers and compute a one-time pad, and they sort of mark it off in the book as they use it to make sure they never use it more than once, and then send the message, and somebody you know, in Langley, Virginia has the same book, and they can read the message and look in their book and see what, uh, what it was encrypted with, and as long as you never reuse a page in the book, this is, and nobody gets a copy of the book, this is pretty secure, or it's absolutely secure. Okay, so we are gonna stop there for today. Um, this is the last material that will be on the midterm. Anything we talk about next Tuesday will not be on the midterm. Um, next Tuesday, I will spend some time in class reviewing the material we'll be going over, and I can answer questions at that point if you have questions about any of the study questions. I did take that study question document and I split it out by lecture so that it's easier to kind of find where they correspond and to see when I add new study questions. So I'll be putting up study questions on cryptography uh, later today or early tomorrow.